Good morning. Welcome to Lehman Avenue's virtual service. I uh, hope that you uh, are all well and tuned in. Uh, looking forward to, forward to hearing another great lesson from Neil. Before we start, I'd like to give you just a few details on uh, services for next week. Next week, we will meet here at the building. Uh, we're going to offer, uh, I know in the, the video that I put out, I said four ways, but uh, it'll be four places that you can worship. Number one, you can still worship at home if you don't feel comfortable being out. Uh, you're ill, you can watch virtually. Uh, number two, you can drive in. Uh, it'll be over the FM station that we've been using. You can stay in the car in the parking lot if you feel safer that way. The third way is gonna be here in the auditorium. Uh, there'll be some uh, guidelines that we'll have to follow. We'll have to uh, adhere to those by going back to church. We pretty much agreed that we will uh, follow the guidelines uh, and there'll be more to come on that. Uh, and once you get here, we'll have things posted for you to read, and uh, we'll, we'll ask you to please follow those. Uh, and then, fourthly, if we have more than the auditorium will seat with the, the seating limits that we have, we have an overflow set up in the MPR, and the service will be piped over to uh, the screen there and the audio. So that being said, there are ways that uh, each one of us can worship uh, with some risk, and we're asking that you pray and uh, consider what you feel comfortable with right now. This pandemic is uh, still with us, and we're trying our best to remove as many risks as we can. Uh, we'll start the uh, latter part of the week uh, wiping down the pews and the bathrooms and making sure everything's uh, sanitized once you arrive. Uh, but there is some risk for you, and that'll be on you to make your choice. That being said, uh, let's go to our Heavenly Father in prayer, please. Father, we humbly come before thy throne this morning thanking you for your son, Jesus, for the love that uh, you have for us, that uh, you gave your best. He was willing to come to earth, to walk as man, to live as man, and yet not sin, and leave us a perfect example to follow. Being tempted in every way, he was a man. He endured every hardship and every trial that each one of us do daily. He understands our needs. He understands our feelings. He understands our frustrations. He understands our joy. Father, this pandemic has uh, something that uh, most of us, or all of us, in this lifetime have never seen. It's nothing new to earth to the world, to, to, to humanity, but it's new to us. And it's taken us out of our uh, routine, our comfort zone, but it's also taught us to lean on you. And it's also taught us that we're not in control, that you are. And Father, we know that uh, all things work to good, to the good, to, for those who love the Lord. And we believe that there will be good come from this, even through the bad. There's many lives been lost. Uh, many hardships been caused. But Father, we know you are our sustainer, our creator, our everything. And through you and with you, we will get through this. Father, it's taught us, this pandemic has taught us the value of family the value of our friends, the value of a simple smile, a simple handshake, a hug. But it's even more than that, Father, it has taught us the importance of being able to worship together. You are so wise and so much higher than us that you understood all this before you even created us. 
That's why he created us that way. We long and pray for the day when we can uh, hug each other, pat each other on the back without worrying, but help us to to realize that uh, some of us have uh, maladies that uh, this disease thrives on. Some of us don't even know that we may have it. But help us to be thoughtful to others, to care for others, to love others, to continue doing good things for others, to share the gospel with others, and to remember that uh, our time on earth is like a vapor. Here today and gone tomorrow. Help us to do as much good while we walk this earth as we can. Help us to share the gospels with as many people as we can. Help us to live as we should so others can see you and us. Please forgive us when we fail you. Please help us to be more like you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Our first song this morning will be number 111, Come We That Love the Lord. We'll sing the first, second, and fourth verse. <clears throat> Come we that love the Lord and let our joys be known. Join in a song with sweet accord. Join in a song with sweet accord. Thus around the throne and thus around the throne. We're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to Zion, the beautiful city of God. Let those refuse to sing who never knew our God. But children of the heavenly king, but children of heavenly king may speak their joys abroad, may speak their joys abroad. We're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to Zion, the beautiful city of God. Then let our songs abound and every tear be dry. We're marching through Emmanuel's ground. We're marching through Emmanuel's ground to fairer worlds on high, to fairer worlds on high. We're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to Zion, the beautiful city of God. Our next song this morning will be number 288, I Need Thee Every Hour. We'll sing the first and last verse, and then we will have our opening prayer. I need thee every hour, most gracious Lord. No tender voice like thine can peace afford. I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior, I come to thee. I need thee every hour, most holy one. Oh, make me thine indeed, O blessed Son. I need thee, oh, I need thee. me now, my Savior, I come to Thee. 
please bow with me as we go to our Father in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, hallowed be your name. We humbly bow before you at this time to bring honor, praise, and glory to you. To lift your name on high so that we can, we can see our place as your creation. That we can see you as our creator and sustainer of life. Help us, Father, as we come to you at this time, worshiping you, that we put away the cares and stresses of this life that is fleeting from us, even as we speak. Help us, Father, to understand the importance of looking to another life that is not fleeting. Help us, Father, to look for eternal life that we can have through the sacrifice of your Son because you loved us so much. We love you, Father, and we pray that we will, uh, during this hour, be able to offer up um, a worship that is satisfying, um, a worship that brings glory to you. As we petition you, Father, we want to pray for those of us that are are hurting or sick, uh, namely uh, our sick uh, Chastity Wells and Sister Cameron Eubanks and also Brother Leroy Johnson. We ask your healing hand be with them. We also ask for comfort for Shirley Miller and she grieves the loss of her husband, Daryl. We pray that... Uh, someday soon we'll be able to put our arms around her and to give her what comfort we can and we pray father that you're with her at this time we also rejoice father in the that we can um, celebrate a new soul brought to you as brooklyn neville has put christ on in baptism this week we're so thankful for that and we rejoice with her Father, we also want you to look over us in the fact that we're going to be um, stressed throughout the week because of things going on in this life, once again, that we can't necessarily control, but we have to continue to stay focused on and embrace our hope that we have through our faith Help us to be unified in that so that um, we're not combating one another, that we're showing a united front and not only our hope that we have in our faith, but also in the love that we have one for another. And we pray that um, as the world looks at us and our response to all this, for lack of a better word, craziness in our world, that we are completely focused on the next life and not this life. And um, that we can demonstrate to everyone that looks at us that there is a light. It's not our light. It's the light of Jesus Christ, the light of the world. And help us to uh, convey that to them, that our hope is because of that. Help us to be able to defend it. Help us to be better students of the word so that we can we can answer those questions. We pray, Father, for those that <clears throat> are in harm's way, those that are um, serving the ones who are sick. Um, we pray for their protection. We also pray, Father, that um, we, in the, in the near future, will be able to enjoy fellowship one with another again but not just an earthly fellowship that we're praying for, Father, but we're so thankful for the promise of a heavenly fellowship, one with your dear son, Jesus, and one with each other and with you. We long for the day when we can enjoy our mansion that's been prepared for us. We pray, Father, that uh, you will forgive us when we do and say things that are not in alignment with your will. We ask you to
continue to be with us as we strive to become better and remove sin from our life and repent, turn away from it, never to return again. And it's in your son's name we pray and give thanks. Before we are led in communion, let's sing, Lord, we come before thee now. We'll sing the first and last verse. <clears throat> Lord, we come before thee now. At thy feet we humbly bow. Oh, do not our soon disdain. Shall Dear God, Holy Father, we bow before you today on this beautiful Lord's Day. We come together to focus on thy son, the sacrifice that he give on the cross on our behalf. Dear Lord, as we, as we are about to partake of this loaf that represents thy son's body, may we do so in a worthy manner. May we block out all the worldly thoughts. May we focus on the importance of the giving of his body and what it means to the Christian. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Let us pray. Dear God, we come before you thanking you for the blood that was that flowed freely down the cross on our behalf. Dear Lord, for we know that if we walk in the light as he is in the light, you are true and just to forgive us. We pray that as we partake of this fruit of the vine that represents thy son's blood, that we would do so in a worthy manner. Be with us as we partake. In Jesus' name, amen. As far as our giving, there has been three or four options laid out before us. Uh, number one, you can come by the building during the week and drop your ch check off. Uh, number two, you can, you can mail a check. And number three, you can go on the Lehman Avenue website and pay online now. Uh, just follow the directions there on the website. And now, if you would, let's have a prayer. Dear Lord, our God, we bow before you so thankful for the blessings of life that you have given us. Not only the, the spiritual, but the physical. You have allowed us many talents. You have given us ways to earn a living for our families. We pray that you would help us as men to focus on what is important as we go about our daily tasks. 
pray that you would help us with our monies. We pray that we would be good stewards of our monies. We pray that you would help us to always be willing to not only lend a hand for folks, but to help with our monies if we're able. We pray that you would please be with the elders of this congregation and help them to make wise decisions so that we can further the gospel. And we pray that you would help us to be humble people. We pray that we would be a humble church. We pray that we would always look for ways to serve. And we just want to thank you so much for the blessings that you have given us. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Before scripture reading this morning and Neil's lesson, let's sing number 708, Walking in Sunlight. <clears throat> sing the first, second, and last verse. Walking in sunlight all of my journey, over the mountains, through the deep vale. Jesus has said, I'll never forsake thee, promise divine that never can fail. Heavenly sunlight, heavenly sunlight, flooding my soul with glory divine. Alleluia, I am rejoicing, singing His praises, Jesus is mine. Shadows around me, shadows above me, never conceal my Savior and guide. He is the light in him, there's no darkness, ever I'm walking close to his side. Heavenly sunlight, heavenly sunlight, flooding my soul with glory divine. Alleluia, I am rejoicing, singing his praises, Jesus is mine. In the bright sunlight, ever rejoicing, pressing my way to mansions above, singing his praises, gladly I'm walking, walking in sunlight, sunlight of love. Heavenly sunlight, heavenly sunlight, flooding my soul with glory divine. Alleluia, I am rejoicing, singing his praises, Jesus is mine. Please turn your Bibles with me to the book of Leviticus, chapter 18. Leviticus 18, I'll be reading verses 1 through 5. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel, and say to them, I am the Lord your God. You shall not do as they do in the land of Egypt, where, have you, where you have lived. And you shall not do as they do in the land of Canaan, to which I am bringing you. You shall not walk in their statutes. You shall follow my rules and keep my statutes and walk in them. I am the Lord your God. You shall therefore keep my statutes and my rules. If a person does them, he shall live by them. I am the Lord. Good morning. You know, this week has always, well, at least for 28 years, has been um, one of, if not the greatest week of the year. Uh, it is the week in which my anniversary falls, and that's uh, going to happen this week. It'll be our 28th anniversary, but it will also now forever be special for a second reason. I don't, probably not something that has caught your attention, but it's certainly at the forefront of our mind. It was a year ago this week that you graciously offered, and we accepted the invitation to come and work at Lehman Avenue. It's hard to believe that that has been an entire year, but we're grateful. We're grateful to be here, to be a part of this family. You have welcomed us in and made us feel so at home, and we, we are so thankful for 
what we know the future holds because God is in control and because this is a great church. We're thankful to be here among so many wonderful folks. And I want, you to, I want to say that I am so thankful for the men who lead this congregation. And I'm specifically speaking, there's so many talented folks, but our elders. You know, you think about how through this crisis that's going on, how the president has gotten up before the people and given updates on a regular basis. Governors uh, have done the same thing. Uh, and how uh, vital that's been because information changes all the time. I think about how active our elders have been through all of this to speak to us through video, to uh, uh, reach out and to make t uh, contact with the congregation in various ways, and we're so blessed uh, to have their capable shepherding. You know, God is the great communicator, and the Bible is proof positive of that. I like the way the Hebrews writer conveys it as he begins his great epistle. He says, God, after he spoke to the fathers, through the prophets in many portions, in many ways, has in these last days spoken unto us through his son. This is to convey to us that God has had many ways, many portions in which he spoke to people throughout time. And now ultimately, finally, he's spoken to us through Jesus. And I like to think about the many portions and many ways that God did communicate to the people. You may remember that God communicated to Belshazzar through a disembodied hand in, in uh, Daniel chapter 5. That God communicated to Balaam through a talking donkey in Numbers chapter 22. That God communicated to Aaron and the other high priests through that enigmatic uh, Urim and Thummim that we read about in Exodus chapter 28. That God spoke communicated to Elijah through a still small voice in 1 Kings chapter 19. And God communicated to Moses through a burning bush in Exodus chapter 3. And it's on that occasion that you might recall that as Moses is giving his excuses for why he should not lead the people of God, that he says as one of his reasons, what if the people ask me who it is that has spoken to me, that, that, whose message I'm bringing? If they ask your name, what shall I say? And this is where God introduces that self-existent name. That name that tells us that he has always been, he's the uncaused cause. He is not the God who was, he is the God who is and has always been. You remember, I am that I am. Exodus 3, 12 through 14. And there is in that particular name an idea that's conveyed several times in the Old Testament. If you paid attention as John read the scripture to us a moment ago, you may have noticed a phrase that recurred. It is an important phrase because it establishes God's authority and his right to rule. It's a phrase that's used throughout the book of Exodus. It's the, the phrase, I am the Lord, or alternately, I am the Lord, your God. And on three significant occasions, that phrase is used in the book of Exodus. This phrase is used as uh, we see God bringing the ten plagues on the people of Egypt. In Exodus chapter 6 and 7, he begins those plagues by saying, I am the Lord, your God. Second time he uses that in the middle of the wilderness, they have been eating the manna that God has provided for them, that, that, uh, that carbohydrate, if you will, but they want some protein. And in Exodus 16 and verse 12, before he floods the land with that meat, he says, I am the Lord your God. But the third time he uses that phrase is in the giving of what we call the Decalogue of Moses or the Ten Commandments. Before he lays out the rules for what life is to be lived like, he introduces it by saying, I am the Lord your God. On the cover of the Saturday Evening Post several years ago, there was a Norman Rockwell painting that was put there on the cover. And it was a picture of a woman who had gone to the butcher to get her Thanksgiving turkey. And the way that the picture is set up, you have that turkey on a scale, and it hides the butcher from the woman, and it hides the woman from the butcher. And as you focus on the faces, each of them is smiling as, as if each one knows a secret joke. And thanks to Rockwell, we are let in on the joke because he shows us their hands. 
as, as you look at the, the picture, you have the butcher with his fat thumb on the scale pushing it down. And on the front of the scale, you have the woman pushing up on the scale with a dainty forefinger. And both of them would resent being called a thief. They would never rob a bank. They would never steal a car. But neither one of them thought anything about doing something that might gain one of them a few cents and might save the other one a few cents. These were individuals who had lost their moral compass. And as God is preparing the people to go and to live in the land of Canaan, he is letting them know that there is a way that you must live. You know, the Jews for many years thought that I am the Lord your God was the first commandment. But it's not a commandment. It's not an imperative. But it's the basis for how to live life. You can't accept God and reject his will. Accepting the one is accepting the other. You reject the one, you reject the other. In Exodus chapter 20, as the Ten Commandments are laid down, Moses says, I am the Lord your God. And by saying that, he is saying or pointing us to the fact that he is a delivering God. Before he even lays out the Ten Commandments, he starts by saying, I delivered you from Egypt and from bondage. To me, it's an impressive thing that before God ever makes an expectation of us, he is showing us what he's done for us. The basis for following the Ten Commandments for the Old Testament people of God was what God had done for them. They couldn't deliver themselves from bondage. That's why they cried out to him, Exodus chapter 2 and verse 23. And it's interesting to me that over a hundred times from the Passover until the end of Deuteronomy, he says, I delivered you from Egypt. You know, when I think about what God has done for us, we are to obey God and his will because of who he is, his nature, his grace, his power, his wisdom, his love, but also because of what he's done for us. He's delivered us from slavery. Romans chapter 6 and verse 6. I am the Lord your God. By saying this, he is also reminding them that he is a feeling God. Exodus chapter 20, verse 3 through 6. You know, sometimes we can get lost in the thou shouts and the thou shalt nots that, the, that God has feelings. And Moses reminds the Israelites of this very thing. That is, that he is a jealous God. Now, when we express jealousy, it may be with sin, but God's perfect. But what he's saying is that he craves and he covets us. He longs for us. And because of this, it ought to affect the way that we respond to him. Go and stand on one of the tallest mountains that you can find and look as far as your eyes can see. Or get in a boat and a ship and go out into the middle of the Pacific Ocean and stand up and look out as far as your eye can see. Or go out tonight and if the skies are clear, go up and look at the sky and, and use a telescope and see this galaxy and if you can, the galaxies beyond. And God is not jealous for any of that. But he is jealous for little you and me. And you don't have to be a king or a ruler or an international star. Moses indicates to us that God, no matter how insignificant you think you are, is jealous for you. And it's the basis of this that causes us to want to serve and follow him. But he also says, I'm the Lord your God. And in doing so, he reminds us that he is an awesome God. You may remember what happens after the Ten Commandments are given. In Exodus chapter 20, verse 18 through 20, the, there's lightning, there's thunder, the mountain is smoking. The people see that, they tremble, they ask for a mediator, Moses, and it's a test of their faithfulness. And as we think about the Word of God, it ought to cause us to re be reminded of how awesome our God is. We ought to fall down before him because of how powerful he is, and we see that in his word. That hasn't changed today, even though he manifests himself in ways different than he used to through Christ. You know, as you see that phrase, I am the Lord your God, in the book of Exodus. In Exodus, God is using this phrase to demonstrate his power in delivering Israel from Egypt. To lay down his precepts through the Ten Commandments and the rest of the old law. And to show a pattern of behavior. But of the 39 times that this phrase is used in the Old Testament, 21 of those times is in the book of Leviticus. I am the Lord your God. And when Moses uses that word in Leviticus, he's not pointing to the power and the precepts and the pattern. He is pointing to the holiness of God. 
He is saying through this that because I am the Lord your God, distinct from all else, I'm pointing out the holiness that I possess and the holiness that you ought to possess if you follow me. The word holy is found more in Leviticus than in any other book of the Bible. What is Moses trying to say to us when he uses that phrase? What I want to do for the few minutes that we have left is to go to Leviticus chapter 18, the very text that we read this morning, and I want us to see three consequences of the fact that the Lord, that He, God, is the Lord our God. Number one, because the, uh, the Lord is our God, we must live differently from the culture. That's verse 2. As we walk into this chapter, verse 2 and verse 3, we find Moses indicating that they were to live differently from two different cultures. They had been exposed or would be exposed to two distinct ungodly cultures. And Moses is saying that these could, and history will show us that these cultures did adversely affect the Israelites. First of all, there was the culture of their past. If you'll notice in verse 3, I am bringing you out of the land of Egypt. They had been there for 400 years. And this culture had made an impression on them. And we think about the culture in which they lived. It was the most powerful culture, most powerful society on the planet. And as we examine what was going on historically, this is the 18th dynasty. The Hyksos rulers of Joseph's day had been defeated. And when Moses was growing up, you remember he grew up in Pharaoh's house. This was the III, universally regarded as the most powerful Egyptian ruler, Pharaoh, of all time. And then Amenhotep II was his son, Tutmos' son. And that's the king of Moses' adulthood. The one who's going to be defeated, uh, ultimately, in the crossing of the Red Sea. He is an athletic uh, man, a hunter, and one who had international renown. By the time that Moses and the Israelites were in Egypt, did you know that the pyramid project was completed? And they were the ruling empire of the world. They were prosperous. They were perhaps at their financial peak during the generation that the Israelites are going to make their exodus. And while they were prosperous financially, and while they were advanced compared to other civilizations, morally and religiously, they were backward. Medically, they were also in a place where uh, they were full of superstition. Uh, It's it's interesting to look at that culture and to find out uh, how backward they were. In the Ebers papyrus, it was uncovered that one of their remedies for uh, maladies. Do you know what their remedy was for a splinter? You take the blood of a worm and the dung of a donkey and you rub it into a, uh, the splinter. And that's how you treat it. That's what their doctors said. And it's no surprise their thought was that if you infect a wound, that that's how you treat somebody. And because of this, over 3,500 years, no doubt millions of people died because of this deliberate infections. Moses was a product of that society, Acts chapter 7 and verse 22. And despite this, he gives guidelines that transcend that culture. But God was worried about the spiritual impact that the culture of their past could have on them. But then there was also the culture of their present. He says, I'm going to be bringing you into the land of Canaan. When you look at what's going on in Canaan, you're going to find a people who are guilty of all kinds of immorality. Archaeology has uncovered for us the things that they did to their children, the sacrifice, the the ritual prostitution, but there were no decalogue. There was no commandments. And so the religion of the Canaanites was far easier than what uh, God was laying down for his people. And so the difference between the Egyptian culture and the Canaanite culture and what God wanted them to have was a difference that was based on his name. And his name was the basis of their distinctiveness. I find it very interesting that God speaks to us in the New Testament in the same way. There may be the culture spiritually of our past, and certainly there's the culture of our present that we find ourselves in. And what God is saying is, I want you to live differently from that. I have called you to be distinct from that. When we think about our culture presently, 
It grows more anti-God every day. I pray that there's going to be a revival through times like this and so often in the culture of our past when there has been difficulty and oppression it has awakened people to their need of God and their dependency upon Him and they begin to see that something must be deeper than just this life. I was talking to a friend of mine this week and he said that he has a friend who runs a charter boat in the state of Florida and that man for years has been an atheist. He's not uh, uh, actively opposed but you know, he always uses every opportunity to talk about how silly it is to believe in God. And he asked my friend's dad this week, hey, tell me a little bit more about your church. Even though that's the case, on the whole, without us being able to influence our culture, so many are going further from God and they would like to press us with regard to this. One example of this would be something that Cal Thomas talks about in his book, and that is the censorship code that Hollywood put on itself in 1934. I'm not sure if you're aware of this or not, but in 1934, Hollywood itself policed itself and they laid down censorship guidelines that no movie should ever throw the sympathies of the audience to crime or evil or sin, and they were specific. And that includes things like brutality or sexual promiscuity or making fun of religion, particularly Christianity. If Hollywood 2020 were to open that up and look at that, they would scoff at every single thing that was done just 86 years ago. And the culture would like to impose that morality on us. But God has us living distinct in a world whose culture is so much different than the culture that God places on us as the people of God. You go to places like 1 Timothy 1, 9 through 11, and Romans 1, 26 through 32, and Paul could be as easily speaking of 21st century America as it is 1st century Middle East. God calls us to be distinct on the basis of his name. I am the Lord your God, and because of this, we must live differently from the culture. Number two, because he says, I am the Lord your God, because he is the Lord our God, we are to know his will. You'll find Moses in the next two verses using this phrase, I am the Lord your God. And in doing so, what he is saying is that this is the basis for the statutes and the judgments that are going to follow in this chapter. We are to follow what God says simply because of who he is. But there's also the benefit that comes in knowing and doing his will. You know, as we think about what we just mentioned a moment ago, there's great benefit to our lives by following the precepts of the Bible. If you think about, um, there's a book written by S.I. McMillan called None of These Diseases that includes the example I gave it a moment ago about the Egyptian remedy. God is giving them, and in the, the book of Leviticus, remedies that are recognized today as medically sound, though people didn't know it for literally thousands of years. There's an argument to be made that by following the Bible, it will benefit us health-wise. There's a, a further uh, proof to be made that by following the Bible, we will find ourselves to be more financially more prosperous just by following the precepts. And at times, we'll find ourselves even socially more popular. But God's not concerned about those things. He's not giving these guidelines primarily for our physical well-being, but for our spiritual well-being. And as we understand who he is, it becomes the basis of why we do his will. We use his word to enrich our lives. Because he is the Lord our God, we are to do his will. But then third, I want you to notice with me, when he says, I am the Lord your God, because he is the Lord our God, we are to live moral lives. Verse 6 through 30, the rest of the chapter, is devoted to different imperatives to how we are to live morally. And those imperatives basically fall into three categories. There are imperatives about heterosexual ethics. And that's verse 6 through 19. There are imperatives about how, or is an imperative, about how parents are to take care of their children in verse 20. And then there are imperatives about uh, ethics with regard to sexual deviance in verse 22 and 23. And these are laid down so that they can understand how God wants them to live morally. You know, we find ourselves living in sexually confusing times. When we think about the ethics and the, the sexual problems of our society, first of all, there's the long-standing ethical issues that 
we face with regard to adultery and fornication. Hebrews 13 and verse 4 says, Marriage is honorable in all, and the marriage bed undefiled, but fornicators and adulterers God will judge. The Guttmacher Institute indicates that just under 50% of all teenagers between the ages of 15 and 19 have at least one sexual partner before marriage, and the average age in which this first occurs is the age of 17. With regard to adultery, it's hard to find one static study about this, but anywhere from 30 to 60% of all married, uh, married couples or people in marriages say that they have at least one affair during the life of their marriage. Do you know there are millions of people, about 20 million of them, that lo have logged on to a website that's infamous tagline is, life is short, have an affair. In the midst of a culture that's like this, God says, I'm the Lord your God. And because of this, you are to live with a different ethic with regard to your sexuality before and during your marriage. But then also we find that there is the need for us to show sexual distinctiveness where there is confusion about deviance. And in that list that Moses has here, the one that is most relevant to us in our culture has to do with homosexuality. You know, there perhaps is not the activism or it doesn't seem that way as has been in the recent past, but perhaps that's because almost every law against it has been struck down and because society as a whole embraces that. But we must be convicted that God has not changed his mind since he wrote his word so long ago. And not just with regard to the Old Testament, but under the covenant of Christ. But then there's also the sexual deviance that's available with regard to pornography. You think about the deviance that Moses mentions in this chapter, and you'll find much of it peddled as mankind tries to fulfill the most perverse fantasies that mankind has. 75% of all pornography is viewed on a phone. Do you know that 35% of all downloads of any kind are pornographic in nature? And every kind of deviance is explored through that. God is writing to us, is appealing to us in a culture like this, and he's saying, I want you to have the ethics that I have laid down. This is a gift that I have given, a wonderful gift that can be enjoyed, but it can also be perverted through these ways. But also he tells us that he wants us to be in, in, in control of the protection of our children. Now, what they did was a physical sacrifice. We need to make sure that we're not sacrificing our children as we are the caretakers of their spirituality. As we nurture them day by day in the home and we put Christ first in how we live and what we do. As we put him before anything else that may come along. And we make sure that we're guiding them in the way that when they're old they won't depart from it. When we look at all that is said here and we put it in the framework of what Leviticus 18 is saying, God is saying, if you look at verse 6 through 23, all these sins are the things that the Canaanites had done and God calls it defilement and abomination. Defilement is the cause of being unclean and abomination is the result. God says, I detest it. God speaks to us similarly in the New Testament. And he tells us that because he is the Lord our God, we are to live moral lives against the grain of the culture. The Great Wall of China was a massive work of security. The Great Wall of China is 1,500 miles long at its completion, 30 feet high, 15 feet thick. And the, the emperors uh, in the various dynasties would often refer to it as the impenetrable wall. Nobody ever blasted through it. Nobody ever climbed over it. But in the first 100 years, it was penetrated three times. And here's how. Individuals who sought entrance went up to the guards and bribed their way in. You know, when I think about the protection that we have, God has given us a spiritual wall to keep us safe from any attack that Satan might send our way but the thing is, we've got to make sure that we don't open up the doors of our heart and let him in. Proverbs 4, verse 23 tells us that we're to keep our heart with all diligence, for out of it are the wellsprings of life. The Ten Commandments were nailed to the cross 
when Jesus died there. We're not under the old law today. But we have an entirety of the Bible that is given to us with the same idea in mind. He is the Lord our God. And the truth of that, his name and what his name means and what it ought to mean to us is the basis. It is the beginning and it is the heart of obedience. Leviticus 18, distinctly Old Testament, and yet its application is as fresh as today. Because he is the Lord our God, we must live differently from the culture. We are to do his will, and we are to live moral lives. May I encourage you, as you encourage me, to remember this truth about the greatness of our God and letting that be the basis of how we live our lives. Could be that there's one who needs to make a change in their lives as perhaps the world has had too great an impression. Perhaps it is that you in understanding that there is no great profound ultimate purpose to be found in the world want to shed that life to be a disciple of Jesus, to be a follower of our God. That you're ready to act on that great act of love and grace by believing that Jesus is God's son, repenting of sins, and being baptized to have those sins washed away. We're here at all times. We're ready and available to help if we can. If that's something that you need to take advantage of, please make sure that you let us know so that we can be of assistance to you. We love you, and God bless you. Before our closing prayer and announcements this morning, we'll sing our closing song, number 250, How Sweet, How Heavenly. We'll sing the first and last verse. How sweet, how heavenly is the sight when those that love the Lord in one another's peace delight. And so fulfill the word. Love is the golden chain that binds the happy souls above. And he's an heir of heaven who finds his bosom glow with love. me please dear lord thank you for this wonderful day we have today to worship you and um lord praise your name and lord thank you for this wonderful lesson we've had today help us to take it to heart and lord do our best to spread it every day lord please be with the leaders in this country to help us get us through this pandemic and um lord we're really praying and that uh, very soon we'll be able to come back to our church family. And, um, dear Lord, please be with the people in this church that are uh, struggling through this pandemic. And uh, please be with them, those families, and uh, help us all to recover quickly. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs> There are a few announcements, and uh, Brother Derek is uh, so appropriately and so well uh, touched on a couple of them in, in his prayer earlier. Uh, first, all of us rejoice that um, uh, Brooklyn Neville uh, was baptized two or three days ago, I believe, uh, and uh, certainly we celebrate with that family uh, that uh, wonderful occasion. Uh, we also remember those who are uh, ill. Uh, Brother Leroy Johnson is ill at home, so let's keep Leroy in mind. Um, let's also remember Chastity Wells and Cameron Eubanks, uh, who are both ill at home. Uh, also, I learned yesterday that Sister Dolores Seaton is not feeling well uh, over the last couple of days. Uh, she's okay. Uh, uh, late yesterday, I talked to Harold. She's doing better. And then let's remember Shirley Mills and the loss of Daryl, and this all rejoice in seeing the great
example that Shirley set in taking care of him for so many difficult months. Uh, I'll briefly repeat what Russell said about the service options next week, uh, but uh, I'll do that uh, uh, asking for the spirit of cooperation because we're doing something that has not been done here before, I'm sure, uh, and uh, it has been organized, I'm sure, but it will require some cooperation. Uh, there will be a, 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 some sort of seating process to make sure we're following the established guidelines. It would help, of course, if folks arrive early and not um, most folks arriving in the last uh, eight or 10 minutes before the service begins at 9.30, so please keep that in mind. Uh, that's all we have, and let's, uh, as has already been said, let's especially remember our most vulnerable members, of which there are several. Uh, thank you, and good day.